Well, I'm glad those technical difficulties are over. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't not laugh at the chickens. I love the chickens. The, the <laughs> chickens and the XR two hundred go perfectly paired. It's funny because the chickens actually reside at the E-Reg headquarters. <laughs> Those are the originals. Yep, yep. I lost one though. Anyway. Oh yeah. Well, that we'll get into that another time. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> um. So yeah, it's nice to see you, Dallas. It's been it a is nice to see you. Yes, it has. We haven't had a live in a, I don't know, months probably. I know. It's been too long. The people have been uh, requesting this. So that's good. Yeah. yeah. You have been on the road and busy. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been lit <laughs> lately. Yeah. But you have, you've had one heck of an adventure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's about to turn into another adventure because I'm going on the road in like three days. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be exciting. To yeah. southeastern the USA, right? Yeah. Georgia, South Carolina, okay. North Carolina. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, so I see people are jumping in in the comments, which means people are watching. Um, so for those of you who are hopping in on this, Dallas and I are going to have a conversation about learning to ride and specifically um kind of our opinions on whether you should start out on dirt or start start out on the street i know you guys all have um lots of opinions on that because i saw it in the comments earlier so i'm excited to get into this yeah i saw a lot of comments on facebook as well when we posted it yesterday a lot of people were you know screaming dirt of course but i i'm not sure that most people start on dirt. I think most people learn to ride a motorcycle on the street. Maybe. I mean, my opinion is going to be, um, should be taken with a grain of salt because for me, I've <laughs> never even had a street license. Don't, don't hurt me. <laughs> um, I've only ever ridden dirt. So I do have a, an opinion on the topic as an instructor for sure but i've also never really ridden on the street other than uh, at the isde and the odd time where i've um <laughs> rid mm. ridden on the street for whatever reason but yeah. yeah accidentally you were lost obviously yes yes i was lost <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i would and we don't know the stats but i would suspect that the majority of motorcycle riders that are out there in North America slash the world probably learn to ride on the street, except the dirt people, which is us. We usually, the story is, especially re-entry riders that I, I know, they rode dirt bikes as a kid and then they left that for a while and then they came back and they, um, re-entered dirt right yes that sounds very familiar i hear a lot of people kind of giving me that same story at my clinics actually right right it's the classic we call them re-entry riders okay we see them all the time they're 40 ish 35 ish because usually what happens of course they you ride as a kid and then um you there's a variety of things that happen when you're 20. The, the number one thing is you leave your parents' house. So you get off the teat, so to speak, of the financial teat of like having your family take care of you where you can actually afford that. And then as soon as you're on your own, your 20s, man, oh man, you can't afford that. Right. Yes. And then, you know, you, you get rid of your motorcycle until you establish some sort of that allows you to earn money and then when you can earn money usually you need a spouse and that ties you up in all kinds of knots for x amount of years and then there's children and then we see these people come back in like 35 when they can afford it and they actually have time yeah that's exactly the story i hear from so many people at my clinics they're usually yeah. in their 40s or even 50s 
Um, and they, they say that I just started five years ago. Um, haven't been on a bike since I was a kid and I, I'm always like, Oh, why'd you take so much time off of riding? And they say that, uh, you know, (laughs) life happened. And so it makes me realize that not everyone in this world bases their life around riding their dirt bike. (laughs) Although I have, you know, I've done everything in my power to be able to focus on riding, but it's not it's not feasible for a lot of people. (laughs) No, I think that your perspective about motorcycles is way different than most people's. (laughs) But it's, it's good. Like, I mean, it's, it's good to have your perspective and then, you know, you meet those people in the clinics and be like, Oh yeah, right. You haven't ridden your entire life. Yeah. Right. So, you know, during that process, I, I feel like, when they re-enter, you know, re-enter the atmosphere of dirt, which is awesome, they have to consider if they're actually going to ride a dirt bike. And I think that's a really difficult decision for most people to make as an adult. Like, if you're not into riding dirt bikes and you're 36 and then you have to announce to your family and friends that you're about to get a dirt bike, <laughs> like, that's a difficult conversation. I don't see why. Well, here's here's what I faced, and you know my situation very well, but, you know, I rode as a kid, and I I thought, you know, do I want to ride a street bike, or do I want to ride a dirt bike? And I just said, F it, I want to ride a dirt bike, because that's where I had that, that kernel of joy was all derived from dirt. So I thought, you know, I'm an adult, this is going to seem really immature for me to make this choice, because I was basically just a civilian at 32 when I re-entered. And all of my family, immediately, the visions that flashed through their mind was me flying through the air on a freestyle motocross ramp. <laughs> yeah, of and course. Like, Classic. <laughs> and, yeah. And not making the landing. <laughs> yeah. And that would be it. I'd be, you know, quadriplegic and like, that's it. My life's over as well as their lives with me. It's just like. You know, so that they imagined the worst thing that they could possibly think about. And then, of course, I had to fight fight against that perspective or perception. And, um, yeah, so uh, that was, uh, that's that's what I think most people who are re-entering have to face. Right. And it's a lot easier to be like, hey, I'm thinking about getting a cruiser <laughs> or like you know, a street motorcycle so I can commute to work and save gas for the family. Right. That's what it is. It's, it's a, a useful thing for everyday life. It's not some, uh, immature hobby or like crazy, uh, midlife crisis thing. It's just a normal thing to ride a motorcycle on the road. Yeah. It's a lot more socially acceptable to do that. (laughs) And our problem you know, both you, you especially, but me also, is that we've been down this rabbit hole of dirt bikes for so long and so intensely that we, it's hard for us to realize what normal, what civilians go through. Right. Well, and what civilians think of dirt biking as, you know, like, I think a lot of people might think it's easier and safer to ride on the street because Like you said, they think dirt biking is flying off a freestyle ramp or, you know, hitting a triple on the motocross track. Uh, Not saying what we do isn't dangerous, but at the same time, I think that riding on the dirt is to an extent. uh, I'm, I'm excluding freestyle, pro freestyle riders and stuff like that, but I think it's safer uh, to ride enduro than it is to swing a leg over a bike out on the street, especially if you're learning. Oh, I, I completely agree. You and I have talked about this a lot. So I, I completely agree. Knowing what we know, we will 100% agree with that statement. But I also agree that the public perception, civilian perception, families, noobs, they completely disagree. They think it's flying through the air. They think street bikes are safe, safe, um, yeah. safer than dirt bikes. But I don't know. I agree with you. I think they're 100% incorrect. 
they're wrong. Yeah. Now, That's what... we both agree, obviously. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, again, I'm biased. I love dirt biking and I'm a dirt bike instructor. Um, but I think, I think having just you, the bike and the trail is a lot easier for you to learn than being surrounded in other vehicles coming from different directions, lights, um, you know, all sorts of stuff going on where, you know, if you crash, A, you look like a real dummy because nobody wants to be laid out on the street on their motorcycle. But also, you're probably going to get really hurt because the speeds are high. You have 5,000-pound vehicles coming at you. Yeah. And I, I think, like, when you have this discussion or we have this discussion in the context of what we've seen, uh, because if you're tuning in and you don't know, um, we've been teaching uh, off-road riding for a long time. And we've seen a lot in that time, like thousands of riders. And um, we've seen all these crashes and we've experienced all these crashes ourselves. So it's like our eyes have been open to like the possibilities of all these different crashes and the types of crashes people have. Like whiskey throttle, yeah. like that doesn't just happen on dirt bikes. Right. I don't know if you've watched YouTube at all, but like you watch any type of street crash compilation thing and it's like a lot of that stuff's whiskey throttle on a 600 cc you know 110 horsepower motorcycle right into a parked car in a parking lot just wham it's crazy right and that stems from not having the natural instinct to, to you know pull in the clutch or do what you need to do and I, even in the street riding clinics, I've never personally taken one, but I've been told by half a dozen people that if you cover your clutch uh, and your brake, you're, you fail yeah. instantly. Whereas for yeah. us, we're, we are always covering our controls so that in a, in a split second, we can, we can react if we need to. Yeah, I, I have heard the same thing. I don't know if it's true. I mean, maybe somebody can chime in and tell us if it's true or not. But like, I heard the same thing. If you if you have a finger on the clutch or a finger on the brake, you can you fail. Like you're not allowed to do that. Um, yeah. But I don't understand why they wouldn't um, encourage that on the street because it just it improves your reaction times for braking and clutch. I mean, I from what I've been told, their reasoning is they want you holding on with all your strength. And they teach you to use three fingers on your levers. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I don't want to like crap all over what they teach or anything like that. But no. to me, it just, it seems mind boggling that you wouldn't want people to, from the very start, know how to be prepared. Yeah, I don't, I, I definitely don't want to crap on what they teach. I just, I just don't understand. Right. And I would like to understand. I wish I understood. Because if there was a reason behind that philosophy, I'm I'm wrong. You know, like I have no idea. But I just I just don't understand because we teach that um, off road. Like, you know, you need to reduce your re reaction time. So you know, you need to be able to cut the power immediately, and you need to be able to brake immediately. Yeah. Um, but but having that delay and like reaching for your lever and then pulling it in, like man, why? if you can just learn to ride with a finger on the lever. Yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for someone to come in in the comments with a, a realis realistic explanation, but yeah, um, yeah. What, what I have seen in the comments, and it's a little bit off topic, but someone named Trent and someone named B BH uh, was also talking about um, dirt bikes aren't really readily available or accessible for a lot of people. Like, mm -hmm you got to load up you so you need a truck you need to have access to a riding area and so i think it's a lot from what these guys just said in the comments it's a lot easier for some people who want to ride a motorcycle to learn on the street mm -hmm. I, I agree i saw another comment about um city versus country and i agree if you didn't if you grew up in the city you're not riding dirt bikes as a kid it's not happening mm -hmm. um 
But um, so I, I agree. What I would say is very slowly, it seems that there are more and more dirt bike training facilities opening in North America. Um, and there's not a ton of them. It's not nearly like street um, training. Right. But they are they are opening. I, I you know, they, they are they are available if you root around and look for them. And I think it would be worthwhile to attend an off road riding clinic or I don't know, something where you can just get your feet wet in the dirt before you deal like add all those other variables of riding on the street. Yeah. At the same time. Yeah. So I guess the other comment, and you know, I'll ask your opinion on this. I have seen lots of new riders in the dirt and I can read body language really well. And I know what's going through their heads, <laughs> usually chaos um, as yeah. they're like doing stuff. And so that means to me that like, they're not comfortable actually just riding the bike. Like they're struggling mentally. They're thinking about things. They're thinking what they need to do. Right. And I can't imagine someone that I love or care about knowing that they were in that mental situation of like still thinking about how to control the motorcycle. And then being like, hey, you know what? I'm going to add a thousand other variables at the same time, stoplights, street lights, yields, on ramps, off ramps, and a whole bunch of variables that you can control. So all these crazy people in cars turning and not seeing like, and subjecting them that's because I feel like it's like, man, a recipe for disaster. Yeah, that that's what gets me. I I I see it at stoplights. I can tell same thing by people's body position when when they come to a stop, they're a little shaky and they both feet come out off the pegs and then they put them down and stop. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, good for this person. They're learning to ride. That's neat. Um, but it's also like, holy crap. Like, there's no way. I When I first learned to ride my dirt bike, it was, it was scary without any of those variables you mentioned. It was scary in a dirt lot, just not stalling. And so... I, I mean, people do it and they don't die, um, but it seems pretty risky, especially for the people who are um, on bikes that are too big. I think a lot of people, when they first start, they, they don't want to buy a learner bike. They want to buy their dream bike. So they'll go and they'll buy like an R6 or an R1, like something that's just way too much. And it's like... <laughs> A whiskey throttle on that baby is going to end in um, mm. carnage. <laughs> mm. I uh, so when I turned sixteen, I got a crotch rocket. So I was like, imagine a sixteen-year-old, and imagine me knowing oh. you know about me on a crotch rocket at sixteen. Like, what a mistake! <laughs> I'm, I'm having anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> I should. I'm having anxiety just thinking about what went on. <laughs> but. It was, it was so terrifyingly fast. And I had ridden dirt bikes quite a bit in my youth, but it was so terrifyingly fast. And the other thing was the only way that I could get a thrill on that bike was to go really fast. So my rule used to be, I just double all the speed limits. I know that sounds insane, but I've just doubled, you know, on these curvy twisty roads, it's like, oh, 60. It's like, oh, well, I just double that. I'm like, oh, I'm okay at 120. And that oh, would be my God. rule. <laughs> and it yeah. worked. It would work like I didn't crash. I'm not dead. But I should yeah. be. But I should be. <laughs> so so yeah. imagine giving someone that's not ridden a motorcycle a lot or 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 they go to their MSF course, their two day motorcycle class. So they get there on Saturday morning, like, woo, we're gonna do some theory. And then Sunday they're like handed the, their graduation certificate and their license and being like, Good luck on that, you know. 600 cc sport bike yep <laughs> or more so yeah it's just it's terrifying it's, um, and that's all they have to do they just have to qualify by going to a two-day class months right yeah <laughs> oh um joe i noticed a comment that anthony put up uh if you don't know who anthony is uh, anthony is the man in the sky who just magically makes everything happen for megs and i um joe lee who's in the comments said something he was playing devil's advocate he said is 
if you drive a car for a long time on the street, it eliminates all those variables. Like you know how to drive a car and you know about stoplights and field. So you learn all that stuff. And then you learn a motorcycle to ride a motorcycle on sticky pavement or tarmac. Mm -hmm. And it's easier to ride than taking someone who knows how to ride a car or in the street bike and then throw them into the, into the woods with us. And it's like, oh, it's totally different. It's way harder. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a fair point. I, I, I'm not going to shoot that one down. Um, but <laughs> um, I think there's, uh, I'm trying to word it without being a turd. I, I, I think he's right there. I think, I think if you have been driving, you've had your license for ages and you know, you know how to drive and you know what it's like. Um, it's going to help. But I will say um, when I was on the road on my bike, um, at the ISDE, I was still, it was still a very different vibe. I, I felt very, um, vulnerable and I, I don't know. I was a little bit, it, it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm just in a car doing, doing what I do. It was, it was definitely different. Yeah, for sure. And I, I also feel like you, like, I'm not going to strongly disagree with, with, I think it was Joe. Um, mm -hmm. but what I would say um, and this is just a generic comment. The consequences of making a mistake on the road and the consequences of making a mistake in the dirt are dramatically different. Right. Like, you could die on the street. And sure, you could argue you could die in the dirt. But, like, here's a, a reasonable statistic that Chuck Carter told me earlier today. He said that if you're an expert enduro rider, your average speed is 35 kilometers an hour. And I don't know what that is in miles. So Americans, I don't know. Um, Megs, you might know what's 35 kilometers an hour in-, in Maybe 20 miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's obviously less, but so, and that's their average. So sure, sometimes they go faster than that, but sometimes they also go slower than that. But you know, 35 kilometers an hour, it's usually not going to kill you. Yeah. But on the street, like, you know, a, a low speed would be 50 and a high speed would be, you know, 150, depending on right. how crazy you want to get. Or, I mean, shit, they can go a lot faster than that. Yeah. There's no surviving a, like a, a 235 kilometer an hour um, street crash. Yeah. Can I tell a story about a crash on the uh, Coquihalla? Please. Is that okay. where you involved or no? No. Um, but it's just, it's an accident that happened on a highway ne near where we're from. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's kind of graphic, but I'm not going to be super graphic about it. But basically some guy was doing like over 200 kilometers an hour on a street bike. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I don't know what happened, but he ran into the back of a, a semi truck. Um, so Yikes. for people in the U.S. Don't, that don't know what semi trucks are, an 18 wheeler. <laughs> um, yeah. So anyways, he ran into the back of it. And when the ambulance came, he was running in circles uh, like off his bike. He was running and when they got his helmet off his head split in half and he died hmm. i just thought like i'm not trying to push say street biking is bad and it's too fast but i just like those are the speeds that some people go <laughs> not... yeah i i'm i completely agree like i mean people die on the street um we live on a twisty road up to ereg hq where we are and uh, you know the road very well and um I don't know, like three weeks ago. Um, well, no, three weeks ago, there was two motorcycle crashes on the road. One was a cruiser and the gentleman was, you know, riding back to Kamloops in a beautiful sunset. Um, he entered the corner too fast on his cruiser. He locked up the rear brake, which stood the bike up right away. And he went right off the road and he had a telephone pole and died on, on the scene. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's like, oh man, like I've, 
I felt it's just one minute you're there and the next minute you're dead. Yeah. Riding your motorcycle. Uh, and the second crash was just the other way going into the community, into the town. And um, they went right off the corner. They blew the corner because that's what always seems to happen. Mm -hmm. And then uh, went right off and ended up in a pasture. Now, he was fine. He was with all his buddies. And they, the tractor drove, dragged the bike back up the hill and blah, blah, blah. But it was like, he's lucky to be walking away from those. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that the consequences of street mistakes are not necessarily cra like, because there's two types of crashes on the street. There's crashes that are not your fault. So soccer mom turns left in front of you and you have no, whatever. Yeah. So that's the one that you're not in control of. And then there's the mistakes where you you entered the corner too fast or you know you're responsible for the crash right but i, but I feel in dirt we're to blame most of the time right i want to backtrack real quick to that first one where you said it's the one that's not your fault where someone can just turn into you yeah. um so if someone's learning on the street Yes, they're aware that people can turn into them and this and that, but sometimes you can still get taken by surprise. But if you're, if motorcycling isn't natural to you, you're most definitely not going to save that situation. So you're not going to, you're not going to go into a stoppy and quickly avoid them or, or throttle out to just squeak by. You're probably just going to panic uh, and get hit by the car. Yep. I, I mean, I agree with you 100%. Like, the beauty, and you know this because we're you're around all the time, we celebrate failure here. And failure, you know, failing, 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 will get you, will allow you to succeed. So the problem, or, you know, that I see it, you don't get to fail a lot on a motorcycle, on a street motorcycle. So you're right, you don't get to learn, like, Oh yeah, this happened. Oh, I always just do this and everything's okay. Right. But we learn that through failure on the dirt bikes, but we, you know, on the street, man, like usually it's just like you're riding along for years and years and years and years, everything's fine. And then just one minute, bang, lady turns left in front of you and just yuck. Right. Yeah. And you, you're right. You just, what do you do? Like you've never, you're not used to emergency situations. Are you ever in an emergency situation when you're riding your dirt bike? Oh yeah, constantly. I'm. I am. I'm not joking. I am. That's the right answer. I know. I know. That's why I. Asked. I am on the brink of not being able to slow down quickly enough with every single corner. Like when when I'm pushing to to right. you know go as fast as I can because that's what we do. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you're on the brink of disaster the whole time. I, and I don't mean you're you're hanging way outside of your comfort zone, but I mean, yeah. within your comfort zone, you're pushing it. Um, yeah. And, yeah. But yeah, you wouldn't want to do that. I mean, some people do do it on the street. There are people out there that live for that. But for the most part, I, I it's not safe for you or other people on the road if you're if you're riding like that on the street. It's a public it's a it's a public area you know so i've heard those people referred to as organ donors on the street that, <laughs> yeah that are on the edge of their comfort zone all the time yeah um so what's happening in the background is chuck carter is texting me and he's listening to us talk about the consequences of street riding and he wants to he wants to try and chuck in for for a bit okay he's got something to say i don't know what Oh, here he is working. <laughs> Are you at the shop working? Yeah, uh, yeah. Half a face. You have a gloves on. There we go. Uh, so, tell us the story about the consequences of street versus dirt, uh, like in relation to how a mechanic sees it. Well, from, I mean, I feel like I feel like most of the conversations we have, like it's a lot more two sided than this. Um, you know, there, there's usually there's usually like another uh, like a valid point from from the other side. But on this one, like it seems to be coming up like 
pretty obvious from from every perspective and i'm not and i'm not gonna like remedy that situation at all uh, but like from a mechanics perspective uh you know sometimes you, you need to go searching for uh for used parts and um both for dirt bikes and for street bikes and when i'm working on dirt bikes like i'm always rebuilding engines and stuff uh but like if you need chassis parts for especially an older dirt bike there's a decent chance that you can find chassis parts. It's usually the engines that fail first. Um, very, very much the opposite with street bikes. Um, the, the wrecking yards you, are, are full of, of bikes that have been crashed with good engines. With street bikes, it's, it's, easy, it's easy to find. It's relatively easy to find a spare engine if you want. Uh, but uh yeah finding chassis parts is almost impossible because the way a street bike dies is in a crash and then they end up in a wrecking yard the engine is fine and the chassis is totaled yikes yeah that's interesting that's a, <laughs> it's a scary thought it's scary well and you know being in the bike industry i i see crashed motorcycles on a perhaps more regular basis than your average individual. And it's usually not pretty. Right. Cool, man. Well, uh, yeah, I know you wanted to tell that story. And uh, so just so everyone understands what's happening right now is Chuck does prostate exams off Mike bike mechanic hours. So I know you got to get back to the old exams. There's probably a lineup outside the door. Is there? <laughs> this is not appropriate for my channel. <laughs> I had to lock the door. We're not on your channel. This is the truth. Look at those gloves. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough to make it as a, just strictly a motorcycle mechanic these days. Medical. He's not these gloves can be used for many, a wide variety of uh, a wide variety of uh, um, activities. Oh, Megs, be I, before go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, before we send Chuck away, I want to let's address Paul. Um, Paul's comment in there, it says, strange that street bike engines last much longer than dirt bike ones. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's explain why, because that's, we know, right? Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, that's, that's fair. Uh, like, uh, street bike engines aren't generally um, in, in as much, like, as high a state of tune as, uh, as as dirt bike engines so like that's a fair that's a definitely a fair comment um but the fact still remains like you know even if you even if you separate if you parse out only street bikes um and and if you were to compare cruisers with crotch rockets um it's easier uh like crotch rockets uh you know they the engines tend to fail sooner and um it's harder to get crotch rocket parts than than cruiser parts but but even still like the it, it's a it's like a it's way biased to one side i mean generally how street bikes die is is by by being crashed but we're harder on uh, for the most part we're harder on our engines as dirt riders oh um, yeah honey that's very funny and, and i mean I think you were kind of getting at they're a little more high performance in ways, right? And like some of your street bike engines that last forever and correct me if I'm wrong, I could be totally wrong, but some of those engines that last forever aren't like as tight and like high compression and like some of our bikes run a little bit hotter and we, we put them through more, don't we? Oh, totally. Yeah. Like a dirt bike engine is designed, you know, an enduro dirt bike engine is designed to last like, you know, not even 200 hours. Uh, I mean, depending on the application, but you know, if you get 200 hours out of your dirt bike engine, you're doing just fine. Um, you know, obviously not the case with a street bike. Your top um, end, do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Bottom ends tend to go, you know, in an enduro application, you know, 400 or more um if you know for for an intermediate rider um uh oh i th that's an interesting comment um 
the like road racers, um, especially uh, Randy Courtney Bennett is saying uh, talking about road racing and yeah, road race engines. So like when you when you subject street bike engines or you know um, street engines to to the kind of stress that we put on our dirt bikes, um, you know they 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 often last a, a, a similar amount of time. Mm -hmm. But like I say, you know, my point is just, you know, from my perspective, um, when I'm sourcing used parts for street bikes, it's usually easy to find engine parts or full engines, but it's very difficult usually to find chassis parts for street bikes. Nice. Scary. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thank you for the comment. I appreciate the um, your perspective because I didn't know that. I never thought about how how street bikes die versus how dirt bikes die because we're so used to that. Yeah, it's just it's just what I thought about when I was you know when we were uh, when I thought about this topic uh, because I run into it on a regular basis. Cool. Another pun run into you. Stop mentioning the pun. <laughs> I don't know. I'm hanging out with uh, oh. Redneck on route all the time and he's a pun guy. Uh, uh, <laughs> terrible form of humor. Uh, anyways. anyways. Uh, we'll let you get back, back to the uh, prostate exams. Oh, and Megs, so I want to talk about prostates after Chuck leaves. <sighs> We're not talking I'm about I'm serious. That. No, we should. Okay. Anyway, Chuck, thank you so much. Ooh. I okay. appreciate your input. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah. I can hear them screaming. Uh, they saw his hands and they're screaming. <laughs> oh, um, man. No, the only reason I want to mention, I'm, I'm, jo I'm not joking about prostate, I, uh, men's health issues. Men that are get older, they should get their prostate checked at 50. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Lots of men die of embarrassment. Okay. <laughs> No, oh. I'm being sincere. I'm being sincere. If there's any older men watching this, they'll understand. All right. Well, that's very kind of you. Yeah. I'm just segueing into that prostate is an appropriate topic for your channel. Okay. I, I'm not going to deny it. Your, take care of your aging spouse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So I had a thought. Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of wanted to talk about the benefits of learning on dirt, um, other than the fact that there's a lot less going on traffic wise, um, like learning how to react to different um, uh, terrain, like less traction, right? Loose gravel, um, slippery, wet terrain, because on the pavement, you're always, it's always super grippy until you come into that one corner with some gravel and um as a dirt rider i would know how to react i would see it and i would do what i needed to do but maybe as someone who learned on the street and who only has experience on the street they may they may see it and not change anything you know and that could lead to a wreck so <laughs> I think riding in the dirt really helps you learn how to maintain traction in slippery situations and how to recognize situations that might need, oh, I got to change it up or I got to, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, the comment that just came up. Uh, thank you, Anthony. Wade Huller, he just said the same thing. He just basically said, you know, traction management on dirt bikes is constant. And on street, yeah. like you said, Megs, it's like, Everything's fine until it's not, it just, and it happens so quick. Yeah. And then back to your earlier point, it's like when something happens on the street bike, you just don't know what to do because you don't face it all the time. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, awesome point. Cool. Do we have any other – do we have any arguments for, for learning on the street? Uh, I would say put it out to people making comments right now. I – I'm, I'm stretched to find an argument for learning on the street besides convenience, which I think is a valid point. So convenience. And then what about learning without having obstacles? So 
the fact that you all you have to worry about terrain wise is smooth grippy pavement i yeah. mean i guess that's a an easy way to learn your controls and how to actually ride the motorcycle mm -hmm. I, I think that learning on street eliminates traction variables so which is good a, and bad <laughs> right it's good in the sense that you're right your your mental focus and energy can go on to control throttle control clutch control riding the motorcycle learning how to corner um keeping your head on a swivel and like looking for traffic and you know all the other things you got to deal with when you're on mm -hmm. the street so I, I think there are you know some arguments to be made but uh, but i would say that only that only works in a controlled environment. So like in a great big uh, parking lot where it's pavement and I think that's good, mm -hmm. but adding all the other variables while you're learning to ride a street bike, man, oh man, that's scary. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk about one parallel topic. It's, it's related for sure. Um, there's a tremendous amount of people going into adventure riding right now. And we were had the fortune to participate in a, an event in BC called the Adventure Bike Gathering um, two weeks ago. And uh, that event's going to grow. I think there's 300 adventure riders showing up for that event. And they're all on, you know, 650 to 1,000 or 1,200 CC machines. Yeah. And it, it's we met people from two different backgrounds. One, people that were coming from the street so you know they used to ride a harley or they used to ride a, you know some form of cruiser or you know something and they're coming over from that um or people who just are being introduced to motorcycles for the first time they're like man this adventure thing looks really cool so i'm going to yeah. buy an adventure bike and go riding so it's like a whole different can of worms for them because they're street bikers moving over to not really off-road, but like they're dealing with traction issues in a yeah. big way on a big bike. And yeah. um, I don't know, it was a really interesting group. Yeah, that stuff, that st sort of thing is really intimidating for me, even as a fairly experienced dirt rider. I I wouldn't want to be dealing with the stuff I deal with on my bike on a, such a heavy machine. I mean, I'm small and I and the stuff I'm riding is ridiculous, but... I still like I look at adventure bikes and I'm like, that's that's an interesting that's an interesting way to get into dirt riding, taking a big, heavy motorcycle onto the dirt and learn learning about traction. <laughs> yeah, in our world, um, in the enduro or trail bike off road world, um, we argue constantly two stroke or four stroke two stroke or four stroke and the knock on four strokes of course is like oh they're so heavy and they're hard to turn and you know the four stroke engine makes a lot of um gyroscopic force and blah 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 so in our world we argue about 20 pounds like that's a huge difference in weight like 20 pounds yeah but when you're moving into adventure bikes you're getting up at like 350 plus yeah and we know how hard it is to ride a bike that weighs 20 or 30 pounds heavier. So think about how hard it is to ride a bike that's um, 400 plus and learning to ride that bike off road um, for the first time. And, and knowing that when it goes down, it's going to be a big ordeal. Like some of those bikes you got to use, like I know some adventure riders carry like little mini winches and stuff in their packs because if that thing ends up down on a on a downhill or something and you're by mm -hmm. yourself, there there's no way. So I guess yeah. uh, for me, I, I would ride uh, uh, timidly uh, if I was trying to take a larger bike into the, the gnarlier terrain, I would be in the back of my mind, I'd be like, well, I, crashing isn't an option. I, I do not want to drop the spike because I can't pick it up again. And because it's going to cost $1,500 in BMW shrouds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, no, I don't want to. I don't want to knock the adventure thing because I'm a big proponent. I'm really happy. Oh yeah, for sure. I, it's just scary as a learning rider. Yes, yes. I, I just. I guess what we're talking about is just the consequences, like you know, yeah. dirt bike consequences. Small, light dirt bike consequences are are smaller. Yeah. And then as you add weight, the consequences just keep getting larger. And then that's not even adding street variables with other cars and guardrails and telephone poles. Right. It's just keeping them off road, but just adding a whole bunch of weight. And I just saw a comment from someone and they said 350 pounds. What are you talking about? Like try 650, 700 pounds of, of off road adventure motorcycle. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> it's a very daunting situation um, to be riding a motorcycle that big off-road um, especially if you're learning yeah yeah i, I agree I, I mean and and everyone has to learn too so like i mean we have to acknowledge that like people need to yeah. learn and maybe the majority of people that learn just learn slowly and they don't have a lot of consequences and they make it okay and like whoo they made it yeah but i don't know i don't know well, we're just here talking and I, I'm looking through it or looking at it through my Meg's brat goggles and I'm picturing like, oh, like we're going to be riding rock faces on adventure bikes. And to me, that's like super scary. But I think a lot of adventure and dual sport riders aren't taking their their 500 pound motorcycles into that stuff uh, at the beginning, at least. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah, don't think I there's very many hard enduro riders on adventure bikes other than like Chris Birch and a few right. pretty badass riders. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that, um, you know, someone just made a great point about adventure bikes being so versatile. So it's like you can leave from your garage at your house. You can run the highway. You can go to the, get a coffee. You can yeah. be in the mountains and then you can ride back. So I, I get it. I guess you're right. We're both looking at through the lens of like, Enduro riders, and then seeing so many newish riders through all these clinics and yeah. having fear, <laughs> like fear for them. Yeah. Concern, yeah. concern, not fear, concern. Right. I I think if I was going to ride on the street, I would, I would get a dual sport or an adventure, probably a dual sport. I, I wouldn't go as far as having an adventure bike. But I would definitely get on that train. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward. I, I want to have an adventure bike uh, in the future because um, I think there are, you know, I, I do enjoy the idea of traveling on a motorcycle and uh, sticking to the back roads and staying out of traffic as much as possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, definitely being more comfortable as I put more mileage on um, and not beat the body up so much. So, I mean, that's another reason why. A lot of dirt riders are transitioning to adventure as they get older mm -hmm. just because you don't need to beat your body to ratchet every time you go out on an adventure bike yeah um yeah anyway uh one last comment i know you gotta go we're, we're coming up on our hour um when when um fitzsimmons who is in the comments who we both know um, she just mentioned, like, it's crazy to think that a GS650 BMW is considered a novice learner's bike in the adventure world. Right. <laughs> That's that, like, wow. It's a lot of bike. Yeah, I can't even. You've been on BMWs. I remember that day you rode that 1200 up here in the field. Do you remember that day? Yeah. So... There are two times I've ridden a GS 1200 right. and the first time I, I was on a big logging road and they were like, Oh, just try it. Just try it. So I got on it and remember I'm very small. Mm -hmm. So I got on it and right away it just, <laughs> I just tipped over, but it had those really big guards around it with like, like metal tubing. So it didn't fall very far. Right. right, right. It was just like, Oh, just pick it back up. But then right. I finally got going and it, the thing wanted to do 60 miles an hour in first gear. And I was <laughs> yeah. like, this is like, sure. this is crazy. And I'm on like a 20 foot wide logging road. Um, and I was like intimidated by it. So props to adventure riders that are out there riding single track. Um, oh, it's yeah. gnarly. Yeah. I mean, I, as a small rider, it's extra intimidating because the bike's physically way too big for me. 
<laughs> um, but it's it's pretty cool. It's just, yeah, it's just all the weight and all the momentum. And we understand intimately what weight and momentum do to your riding, especially when you're off-road on low traction. Yeah. And it just, all those things just give you the shivers. Yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Well, um, awesome. Yeah, that was a good one. I like that. Me too. I like talking about this. We've been talking about this for a while. And yeah. um, I think it evolved because of um what we've been seeing um and uh a, a lot of people that i've been seeing lately are coming from the street yeah and they're trying dirt for the first time and when i see them wobbling around like a little duckling in the field it gives me great concern for their safety right <laughs> and I, uh, I i i just i it makes me nervous to think about them on the street yeah so um you're off to where south carolina first um i'm going to georgia first uh so i'll be putting on a level one clinic and a level two i've got some really awesome stuff planned for for the groups so mm -hmm. that one's going to be awesome it's at rock crusher farm um mm. so s some people watching might know where that is they host races um Great. so excited about that and then after that i'm going to south carolina uh we got a beautiful piece of private land so uh the students in south carolina are in for a treat as well um and then it's north carolina and that one is at a classic riding area um it's called uh, brushy mountain and it's gonna be sweet same thing level one and level two um so i'm really looking forward to this tour Awesome. So that's the month of October. You'll be out and about. Yeah. Yeah. I leave on Monday and I'm going to be coming back at the end of October. Cool. I see you've got a spiffy new truck too. Yeah, it, it finally happened. Uh, I'm excited to have some reliability on the road. Nice. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, um, I wish you luck in the Southeast USA tour and, um, yeah, we'll have to do this again. We'll have to all those conversations we have about weird topics that have to do with dirt bikes, we'll have to um, do another live. Yeah, I'm gonna. We should each. We're each gonna do a poll on our p Facebook page to see what people want next. Yeah, uh, two strokes versus four strokes. What oil should I run <laughs> in my motorcycle? When should I do my top end? <laughs> right. What tires should I run? <laughs> cool. All right. Okay. Cool. Well, uh, thank you again. Yep. Thanks. It was awesome. See ya. Bye.